a vital part of Britain's defences. Now it's a dilapidated shell patrolled by foxes, vandals and vipers. Hardly what you'd expect of a scheduled ancient monument. My guide was Peter Burkett, a freelance writer who knows the place better than most. Don't ask me why. Well, this is it. Very forlorn, <laughs> very dilapidated. You're not kidding. How many times have you been here? Well, this is my third, uh, third time. You're getting to know it, are you? Starting to, yes. It's, Although you it's... wouldn't say you know the tunnels yet. Uh, no, and uh, I'd quite like to get down into them. Well, I've got news for you, Peter. We're going to go down the tunnels today. Well, if we can find them, it would be wonderful. <laughs> um, I mean, they're rumoured to go miles, and, and it's believed that one of them goes right down to the uh, River Medway. It was built, really, against the perceived threat from Napoleon. But by then, we'd uh, uh, made friends with the French, and the new enemy was Imperial Germany. It'd be fascinating to see who gets this in the end and what they plan to do with it. I know, just imagine it. Just imagine having a home in a place like this. If you had endless amounts of money to spend on it, would you consider buying this and turning it into a, a mansion? Not my thing. <laughs> Not my thing at all, but there are plenty out there that would. The V was put up by the 166 City of Rochester battery, who was stationed here during 1940. And that was really a V-sign to Hitler. Hundreds of soldiers were billeted here in both world wars. By 1940, the fort had become one of the main anti-aircraft bases to defend Chatham against the Luftwaffe. The ammunition was carried all around the site by narrow-gauge railway. I can imagine the patio and the barbecue being here, maybe the swimming pool. But this bit's rather quaint for a fortress, isn't it? It certainly is. It's a sort of beach avenue that seems to have been planted. I would think from the, the date of these or the size of these beaches, they were probably planted back in the war. I would have thought it's about 50 years old. Yeah, on, little saplings like then, I would think. They've grown up to rather splendid little avenue, haven't they? The man entrusted with the job of selling Fort Borston is Clive Emson, auctioneer extraordinaire. He'll have to be. It's fantastic, isn't it? There's uh, so many different things you can do with it. And there's so, I think one of the beauties of going to auction is that um, all the people come along and they have different ideas. Some of them want to convert it into small business units. I don't know if that would be allowed, but that's their problem, isn't it? One of them wanted to use it as a small farm. There's the army interested in wanting to um, put old vehicles here oh, and really? use the casemated places for um, putting the army vehicles. So they're coming up from Wiltshire to have a look. Um, we've had about 100 people over so far. Alan Thomas is one of them. He represents a group of speculators from Streatham who don't need such deep pockets to convert the place because they'll do all the renovation work themselves. It's a creepy sort of place, isn't it? It is, but if your torch is bright enough, it certainly um, takes away some of the fears. Um, very deep, very dank, um, very dark and full of history. So why do you want it? What, what would you turn it into? Well, there are a number of things that we are considering. Um, we're coming back again to get a view of the size of the place because there are so many rooms, it's actually immense. Um, we've looked at things like resurrecting it as a fort, possibly doing something with um, World War II connections, but really we're open to suggestions and ideas yet. Yeah? The first thing to do is to acquire it. This desirable piece of real estate sits half buried in a hillside overlooking Nashenden Valley, which consists of the M2, the Medway Bridge, and the rail link to the Channel Tunnel, still under construction. It's one of the most blighted areas in England. Do you know, a seven-bedroom Edwardian mansion trapped between the motorway and a 190-mile-an-hour rail route sold for £17,000, roughly the price of a terraced house with outside privy. Watch your backside for fear all goats are being butted and also... Wild goats? Yeah, there are some goats up here somewhere. What's and, the other uh, hazard? The other hazard's snakes. Adders? Uh, there's said to be an adder colony up here of some size. Didn't you say the soldiers in the First World War who were billeted here could hear the gunfire from Flanders? Well, that's certainly the legend. Um, this place during the First World War, throughout the First World War, was used as a, as a sort of billeting point for units on their way to the front. And because it's so high up here, and because the noise from Flanders was so absolutely enormous, um, apparently, if the wind was in the east, you could definitely hear, you know, the bombardment going on and the virgin soldiers were waiting to go there. It must have been very unnerving for them. 
The fortress gets its name from the village of Borstal on the banks of the Medway. This is where the first Borstal institution was built to house young offenders, and the village has to live with that stigma. The tunnels seem to be a bit of a mystery how many there are and how long they are and where they go. That's right. Um, I don't think, I, I'm not sure there's any plans of where the tunnels are. I'm told there's about three miles of them. Um, and one of the viewers that came walked for about an hour and he reckons he was at the other side looking down at the motorway. Oh, really? Where that's true, I'm, I'm not going down there, frankly. <laughs> he was almost in Essex. Right? Yeah, I think that's for somebody else to check, but it um, sounds a bit eerie to me, but there is a lot of tunneling here. Three miles of tunnel. Well, that's the claim, but whether or not we find them is another matter. Wouldn't you have thought the estate agent would have gone through every inch of this place since he's selling it? Well, I mean, it would take you an awful long time. First of all, you've got to find the entrance to the things, and then you've got to have the nerve to walk down them. Cupboard? Cupboard? Shall we open this, or could a skeleton fall out? Well, you never know. That's my look. It's a room. There could be bodies here, though, couldn't there? There, there have be anything. There have been bodies down here. Really? Well, one body. I think there was a story that uh, a Borstal boy came down here when, when he was working on the pig farm and, uh, and hanged himself. And, and they thought he'd escaped. They didn't find his body for weeks and weeks. I think there's a hoist down here. A hoist? I think this is what they used to use to, to literally hoist the shells up. Yeah, there's a chain of... I wonder what's up. I wonder Where's where it? this comes out. <laughs> Yes, steps. Oh. Are we brave enough to go down here? Oh, this is da, definitely da, da, da. This has got to be it, isn't it? Yeah, look out for rats down here, Tony. Well, I think they'll be looking out for me. I hope so. <laughs> You're never more than six feet from a rat. Did you know that? Wherever you are. Well, I've got a feeling we might be a bit closer to one than that, frankly. <laughs> this could be the one that goes under the M2. I think it's bound, almost bound to be. As long as it didn't go under the M1 as well, and we come up in Northamptonshire. <laughs> well, awful. You never know. I wonder how many people have been lost down here. I don't how, know. How many prospective purchasers have never been seen again? <laughs> <laughs> but think about being a schoolboy here. You could have a wonderful time. Well, the steps run out here. That's 39, I'll make it. It needs to be used for something, otherwise it's just going to decay. So I think the planners and, and English heritage have got to be fairly pragmatic to allow something to happen here. But a lovely position and convenient, and yet in the middle of nowhere. Well, we've gone under something. I notice that the uh, graffiti has got... Progressively less? Absolutely, all the way. Now we're in some sort of a... Oh, look! Watford Gap Services. Must be along here. No, no, I think it's this way. It's a warren. Now that looks like a door at the end, but it isn't. It's a turn in the yeah, a bend I, in the tunnel. Why are there so many? Well, I think they might, might be to sort of protect people so that you don't have... If you had a firefight down here, the bullets would bounce off that wall. You know what we should have done, the golden rule? Bring a ball of string so we can find a way back. Well, I hope we can. Ah, oh, daylight. Oh, this is amazing. Oh. Well, this is what we saw from the other side, then. This is the firing position. Yep, we saw that from over there, the other side of the moat. And that's the moat? Yep. So if you get into the moat around here, you're dead meat. Well... That's the theory. I wouldn't fancy it. <laughs> and then the tunnel goes on. I think it goes all round the fort. Yeah, these are all firing positions along here. got the graffiti back at this point. This is the end of the line, Pete. The Circle and District runs out. But if you were buying this, what would you do with all of this space? Well, I think you'd probably have to double glaze these slits for a start, because there's quite a gale coming in from there. But that'd be the last of your worries, wouldn't it? Imagine decorating. Well, I don't know. Well, not knocking through. What about knocking through? I don't think you'd be doing any knocking through. But down lit, nicely carpeted. Just imagine it. You don't find this a depressing prospect, then? I think with real light in here, it could be very interesting.
Now, cell block H is obviously the show house, apart from a little rewiring, it's almost finished. What would it have been used for originally, though, Peter? It was probably lined with beds occupied by soldiers who were being billeted here on their way down to Dover and Folkestone to catch their ships to the front. Frightened soldiers, I bet. Terrified. We'll be back in a few minutes to see if anyone's daft enough to buy this place and at what price. We got to £160,000. The temperature was rising, the tension was being sliced into chunks and sold at the door. Everybody loves an auction. And you couldn't miss the main attraction under Clive Emson's hammer at Maidstone last autumn. It was lot number 74, an historic fort in eight acres with potential. What a seductive word that is, potential. It gets you off the hook with anything from a period gas works to a derelict sewage farm. And Fort Borstal certainly comes into that category. Scratch your earlobe to this one and you could spend the rest of your life viewing what you'd bought. So which courageous trooper in this healthy battalion of streetwise bidders would end up with three miles of uncharted tunnels on their hands? There are two types of people. There are one that won't move unless they're bank manager, their building society manager, their solicitor, their uncle, their aunt, their father and everybody else tells them that they may. They are not auction people because they, they, you need people that have got their own mind who tell the solicitor, this is what I've done, now you get on with it. They're big boys, they've got the money, they, they've seen the property. I mean, who can advise whether to buy Fort Borstal or not? Who can advise what it's going to cost to put it right? You know, in realistic terms, you have to make your own decision. The guide price was...